Welcome to this week's Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. I'm Bob Petrucci, joined by fellow Master Coaches Mick Haley, Bill Walton, and Fran Flory. Fran, thank you, thank you very much for filling in for Kathy George. Uh, for our viewers, you know, Fran was a longtime coach at LSU, uh, about 24 years, right, Fran? That's right. That's correct. And I, I believe you were the, the winningest coach at LSU in all sports and maybe even the winningest volleyball coach in the SEC right now. Uh, I, that's too much. That's too much. There's a lot of great coaches in the SEC and at LSU. Uh, let's just leave it at I, I was a longtime coach at LSU. <laughs> well, we're, we're happy to have you with us. Kathy uh, was on a flight right now and not able to join us. Uh, I think she'll be back next week. Um, and, you know, and, and Kathy, we're really excited for her. You know, uh, she just recently accepted the head coaching job at, at Grand Rapids in the in the Pro Volleyball Federation. Uh, so she's pretty busy these days. She went from zero to 150, you know, all in about the course of a day. Well, uh, our topic for today is NIL, and uh, Bill, why, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest today? All right. So first, a little background on how we arrive at NIL. Um, we can trace the NIL roots to a class action lawsuit filed back in August of 2014 by Ed O'Banion, a UCLA basketball athlete. The filing was a result of the athlete not being allowed to receive compensation for their name, image, and likeness. The court ruled that the NCAA bylaws operate unreasonable restraint in violation of antitrust law. The case was decided for the plaintiff eventually surviving the appeals process and finally making its way to the US Supreme Court. There, the case won its first decision in 2016. Five years later, the NCAA passes legislation that goes into effect on July 1st, 2021. So now we have NLI in the NCAA and for NCAA athletes. So with that small bit of background, we arrive at someone who's made NLI their life's work so far. I think it's after, NIL. Yeah, after volleyball. Michelle Meyer, the CEO and founder of the NIL Network. Hi, Michelle. Hi, thanks for having me. Excited to have this little chat. We are too. Um, Michelle, Ed O'Banion files in California, and years later, that suit indirectly gives birth to your career. Can you uh, give our listeners a brief background of who you are and how your company emerged and its mission in the world that has become the NIL? Yeah. Um, so my background <clears throat> is all in volleyball. I played collegiately um, and professionally and then got into coaching. And actually, when I was coaching at uh, University of Hawaii Beach Volleyball from 2012 to 15 was when the Ed O'Bannon case got settled. And I think that that was really the first case that brought a ton of public awareness around the basically the NCAA revenues. And then, you know, they're, they're still monetizing the athletes NIL even after they graduate, which was the case with Ed O'Bannon. That's the video game case, um, as most people know it as. So. That was when I really uh, started studying NIL. And then fast forward, uh, California was the first state to pass a NIL law in 2019, which again, brought a ton of public awareness around this. And at that point, I didn't really understand or really appreciate that a state could stand up and say, hey, like come in 2023 was the initial enactment date that athletes in California would have the rights to the N their NIL, regardless of the NCAA rules. Um, fast forward another year in 2020, it became really obvious that this was going into effect in 2021, but I think due to COVID, not having sports in 2020, a lot of this information really got swept under the rug and people weren't paying attention to it. I mean, in, in my opinion, it's the biggest change to college sports since Title IX. So it's been about 50 years since we've had this magnitude of a change in the NCAA. Um, and so at that point, I, I pulled together um, NIL Network, which really founded on uh, building a resource for athletes, coaches, and administrators to understand all of the changes that were coming in 2021. And it's evolved now. It's um, basically a big hub of you know, different content pieces, videos, some uh, databases, and whatnot, so people can understand the whole 
landscape of this uh, this beast that's been unleashed. <laughs> Michelle, you you used to be at San Diego State University, correct? Yes. What did you do at What did you do at San Diego State? Yeah, so I started um, NIL Network in the fall of 2020. Fast forward a year, and San Diego State was the fourth or fifth university in the country to hire an NIL-specific role. Um, and so I thought, man, I would love to get in there. I'd lived in San Diego at that time um, and helped to, to build their NIL program to what it could be and really get that administrator-type perspective of what it looks like on the ground floor. Because I mean, everyone sees the headlines of you get a car, you get a million dollars, but I kind of had a feeling that that wasn't quite the, the reality for, you know, 99% of the athletes. So now I'm a college athlete at San Diego State. I'm a volleyball player. I contact your NIL network. You've got experience there. That's how I know of you. How do you help me navigate and get into NIL and profit from it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the easiest place for athletes to get started are probably on the marketplaces. Now, I will say there's about 30 different uh, businesses out there that are these digital marketplaces that are connecting athletes with brands. Typically, they'll have national brands on there that are activating thousands of athletes around the country, and they're usually very simple activations. Now, is it life-changing money? No, it's 50 bucks here, maybe a gift card here, but it's something where the brand will give the athlete, you know, post this on your story, hashtag these things, tag these accounts, and it's so simple for the athlete to just even get started and understand what those relationships with brands look like. Um, as I get more confident in this space, I think they're, I always say in four to five years, we're nowhere near what this is going to look like yet. But in four to five years, the, the NIL market, I think, will be mostly at the local level for 99% of athletes. It makes a ton of sense for local restaurants, local businesses around campus to partner with athletes for NIL type activations. Now, local businesses don't really know how to do this yet or understand the positive ROI that they can get. So, Athletes that are feeling a bit more confident, there's a lot of opportunity for them to directly reach out to these brands, but the education they actually have to provide to the brands and local businesses to get a deal done is quite extensive right now. And I think that ends up frustrating um, frustrating athletes a little bit, but there's a lot of opportunity there. So when you said there's about 30 companies putting athletes in touch with companies, mm -hmm. when you say put in touch with, and they get a gift card or a little cash. Yeah. Does the athlete just go on a website and enroll? So 30 different businesses that are these marketplace models. So it's a two-sided marketplace where they're going out and they're approaching national brands and saying, hey, you should partner with college athletes for X, Y, Z. Brand goes, okay, what do we do? They put together some kind of activation, their budget, whatnot. Athletes on the other side can make a profile on this marketplace usually for free. So they'll go on, they'll put in their information, their school, their sport, their interests, um, their social platforms that they're active on, those type of things. And so when the brand is going, hey, I want to find some athletes, they go onto that platform. Like Open Doors is probably one of the biggest ones in the country. They have tons of uh, university partnerships. I think they said they have over 100,000 athletes. It actually goes up through the Olympic level. I think the USOC has a partnership with Open Doors as well. Um, so brand will post whatever they want to do with college athletes, or they can filter through that marketplace, which is essentially a directory of athletes, uh, to find ones that match whatever type of NIL deal that they want to do with these athletes. So it just simplifies kind of the education process, the payment process, the, the tax forms all come as one from open doors, regardless of how many different brands the athletes worked with, which makes it more convenient as opposed Germany. to 20 different tax forms. <laughs> Yes. Um, you, you threw out a three-letter thing, ROI. What's ROI for our listeners? Uh, return on investment. So yeah. these brands are putting their marketing <laughs> dollars towards, you know, they, they want to get something back from these activations for the most part. We can talk about the- So uh, I can't just be an athlete and smile and play. I have to actually do some work. Yeah, you do. <laughs> kind of a part-time job. But the cool thing about it is that you know, college athletes, full-time students, full-time athletes, they don't have time to work a, you know, part-time job at the bookstore that requires them to be there from 12 to 5 every day. Their schedules are changing too often and and they just don't have that much free time. 
Um, and so what NIL, what I love about it, it's entrepreneurial and it's something that they can do during their free time. They can engage in it more when they're in their off season during summer and they can taper it back when they get busier finals season, that kind of thing. So Michelle, I understand and having recently retired, there's, there's so much of a time investment for these student athletes these days. And, and you having been on campus, is there a time frame or is there an amount of work that's involved from the student athlete perspective that's kind of expected from these companies? And who helps or how much management is, is uh, involved in the athlete and to create their profile? Like how much help do they get? Yeah, so it's, I think it probably differs school to school uh, in terms of the involvement from the athletic department. There's only about 30 or 40 universities in the country that have an NIL specific role right now. And so for myself being one of them sitting at San Diego State, athletes could schedule, like I felt kind of like a business consultant, like they would come in, we'd build a strategy, talk about how do you build a brand? How do you outreach to companies? Those type of things. Um, but I think at other universities, that's not necessarily the case, um, especially, you know, San Diego State found a power five. But once you get out of the power five at this point, unfortunately, there aren't as many resources in place as I would have hoped. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it does it, you know, the athlete building the strategy of how they want to take advantage of this, the most common way being right now on social media. So through Instagram posts and stories, but in order to get those kind of opportunities, you need to have a community, an engaged community of people who are following you because the businesses are looking for brand exposure, maybe increased sales, introductions to a new audience. Like that's the ROI that they're looking for. Um, and building, building that brand and community is, you know, it does take work and it does take a kind of intentionality that I think, you know, the high school students looking up at this right now, I think are becoming more, um, aware of and kind of preparing and strategizing a little bit more. Um, I would say the, the college athletes on campus, when this changed, were really looking at the headlines and going like, where's my NIL money? And you're like, well, it doesn't really work like that for most people in the world, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, the fallacy of it all is it just happens that the coaches arrange it for the student athletes and the investment from the student athlete perspective is, is pretty large for the people that are in the higher dollar um, and pretty pretty easy for many that are just going and filming a commercial or posting a social media post. It's pretty simple for some. So there's a huge range in that. Um, in, in your experience, I don't know if you have the numbers, but how many athletes do you think across the country are benefiting from NIL? Do you have those numbers to share? Yeah, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, in the first year and a half, it's projected that around like 15 to 20% of any student athlete population at a school has taken advantage of NIL in some capacity. Now I would say that those aren't really meaningful, that meaningful of brand deals. It's usually like, okay, like I was talking about the mass activations that these marketplaces are doing where sure, you know, you get a couple bucks here or there, but it's not necessarily something that really resonates with who they are or brand that even company that they're using. Um, I'd say, just from my estimations, I'd say maybe a thousand athletes made over fifty thousand dollars in year one, um, and and that takes in, of course, with revenue generating sports and that whole collective side with the donors. Just what you're talking about, them kind of pushing that that money out. So, um, yeah, I think that it's a, a little bit smaller out the gates that people anticipated, but I would say that. I think that once, you know, the high school athletes that are strategizing now and understand the landscape a bit more come up into college and then also the local businesses understand why they would do this and how it works and have examples of, you know, success around the country that they'll get more involved. And that's where the real NIL is for, for most athletes. Michelle, uh, thank you for coming on. Um, if I'm an athlete and I'm looking to garner scholarship at a university. Um, does the city that the university's in play a part of this? Uh, a large city like Los Angeles or a small city like uh, Huntington, West Virginia. Um, is, is this going to affect recruiting? Uh, what's What's been your uh, uh, take on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that both 
sides have definite positives and negatives. Um, you look at some of these college towns uh, that are diehard for their sports teams, and they were super quick to adapt. The local businesses got on board right away, and they they understand it. But it's limiting because there's a limited number of local businesses. And so at the end of the day, you know, that market size is smaller versus a place like L.A. that doesn't have the same fansmanship that you see in the South or in the Midwest, but a lot more opportunities for athletes to say, hey, this is, you know, my personal value is what I stand for. And these are the type of businesses I think I can help and support. So um, I don't know. I think that coaches from the recruiting side can can build their story. Um kind of in either direction right now. I would say that another uh, uh, kind of recruiting aspect that I've heard, and again, this is only for those athletes that are going to be making kind of that life-changing money, but the state tax, state um, income tax, Florida has none. California is at 12, 13%. And so if athletes are looking to make, you know, even five figures, does that then weigh into their decision? I go here, I don't have to pay this. And Actually, um, Bill and I were talking before about the Cavender twins, the basketball players who transferred from Fresno out to Miami and kind of got dinged for recruiting inducement or whatnot. But um, I'm going, they transferred because they're making millions of dollars and now they don't have to pay state tax. Like it just makes a lot of sense versus being in California. <laughs> you know, well, what's it, Mick, you know, what's interesting about what she just said is, is that I never even considered that they left California for Florida because they get a 13% raise right away. Yeah, I, I think I think that you follow that from the pro athletes. Uh, they have been very, very wise about picking the states they live in uh, simply because multi-million dollars add up real quick when you're, you're paying 13%. Uh, Washington's 9.5%, I think. Um, uh, Texas has a lot of athletes living in it because they don't have a state income tax. So yeah. it, it's, it's kind of interesting, but one of the things that $50,000 is a pretty good amount of money. And, uh, I've been watching, um, schools, Austin, for instance, is a really fast growing city. The university of Texas has a, uh, capped population of about 51 to 55,000 students, but, but they could easily jump to 65,000 if, if they had building space and if they had a living space. Uh, and of course, uh, that means more faculty and that sort of thing. But for the student athletes, even if they get a scholarship, uh, if they want to live off campus and still be close to campus, it's very difficult and very expensive. Uh, I see students putting this money into well, for instance, I heard in Nebraska, for instance, the volleyball team had all moved downtown. Now in Lincoln, downtown's not a very big place, but but it is downtown. I mean, it's yep. you walk out and you've got the strip and you've got all of the stores and you've got the restaurants and et cetera, et cetera. And they're spending their money that way. Um, it, it seems to me that there should be some counseling and some real serious uh um, education on how to use this money effectively and make it grow rather than just use it to, to make life easier for the four years you're going to be in college. Is there any anybody doing anything like that? Yeah, um, there's a lot of different kind of education company startups in the space that are, you know, everyone knows that that's a very important piece of it. I think that the challenge with that right now is where do you meet the athletes where they are? Like the majority of them are going, gosh, I can't even make any NIL money because, you know, how do I stand out to brands? And then you have the ones on the other side that are making that 50K who need that financial literacy, that education on their taxes. If you mandate all of this, you know, financial literacy education for all athletes, they're going, I can't even get an NIL deal. Why am I having to sit through all the seminars? Like, yeah, sure, it's good for life, but that's not where I'm at or what I want to be doing with my spare time. And so, that's a really big struggle that a lot of universities are dealing with right now. And they're trying to put together, you know, this different education and, and it's just not really um, sitting very well. And, and also makes sense. Like athletes, Gen Z, especially 18 to 22 year olds, they're not going to go log in and watch a pre-recorded course. Or I just, I don't see them doing that. They go to TikTok, they go to YouTube if they want to find information about anything really. Um, and so 
it's definitely a bit bit of a struggle right now um, for for administrators to understand how to meet them where they're at and to provide that information. Is there a chance that uh, they could make so much money that school and even their sport become pretty much secondary uh, with this? I mean, they sp supposedly would need to be good in their sport to be recognized and that sort of thing, but they could develop their platforms. They could do a number of things. Um, it might be how they dress. It might be a, a number of different things. Um, this could go a, a lot of different directions, couldn't it? Yeah. Um, I always say, like, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, does the sec sport come second or, you know, how does this disrupt the locker room? And I always say, like, kind of feel like the responsibility feel like falls on the coach to take that leadership role and address like their expectations with their team to adapt whatever their team guidebook would be to say this is when we're doing NIL this is when it's not appropriate like John Cook I think did a very nice job with that at Nebraska and it seemed to resonate a lot with the girls because again I think you know for these athletes let's say 20 percent are participating from a team and I'm one that is not, if I have a camera in my face all the time because they're recording content to build this platform, I can see how that would get kind of annoying pretty quickly. But if you have a coach saying, this is when you can do it, this is when you cannot do it, I think that that really helps out with just setting setting the tone and kind of the expectations. Yeah, he said he, said he had to lengthen his uh, water breaks because they had to call their agents and uh, um, check in at certain times during practice. So he's added a bit of humor with it. Uh, not so funny if you're out there doing it. <laughs> I would tell you that. Um, well, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, Bob, Michelle, you wanna... I, got, I have a, a question about where you see this going. I mean, it's your third year of NIL. You know, what's coming down the road from the NCAA regarding rules and regulations governing NIL? Yeah, so there is a, a federal NIL hearing, I think, in about a week. Um, really? Where, see where that goes. Uh, you know, there's a number of federal bills that have been proposed over the last couple of years. Uh, now, I, I think it's a very strategic hire by the NCAA, bringing in Charlie Baker, who does have those relationships with our, you know, senators and House of Representatives. Um, I don't really see them being able to come together to make a bill and pass it, but... Um, We'll see what happens there. If they don't, I mean, that's really, there's a lot of other things outside of NIL that are being pushed right now uh, at the NCAA, you know, student athlete employment, um, different types of education benefits and and whatnot. So I think regardless of NIL, um, the model is, is going to probably be shifting and changing over the next decade. I don't know. Um, but in terms of NIL and where I see it going, um, like I said, I think like the Local market's going to continue to develop, which is going to give a lot more opportunities to athletes outside of the revenue generating sport, um, as well as those high school athletes that are going to be more uh, prepared to take advantage of it. And I think I give this kind of, I think it's a good example, but when I started coaching at University of Hawaii, that was the first year, you know, beach volleyball is still an emerging sport hosted by the AVCA. And every year, the recruiting class, like all the coaches get together and be like, holy crap, like this recruiting class is like exponentially better than the last one. And it was like this like growth in the level of beach volleyball athletes. It started to like teeter off now a decade later. Um, but that's kind of what I see with NIL as well, that every class of high school athletes that are coming in will understand the landscape better, have a better strategy to take advantage of these opportunities versus the athletes that are there right now that really it's a lot of work from both sides, like for them to understand the whole landscape and then also for them to go out and get those meaningful partnerships when it's still just such a new thing for brands and businesses. What do you think the administrators are looking for right now oh. from the NCAA? Because, you know, we, we had a situation with the portal and, and then the NCAA came out and started putting in regulations that really either, you know, handcuffed the athlete or handcuffed the, the coach. It was kind of like after the fact, like, you know, unexpected, you know, consequences of, of, the decision to have the portal in the first place. Do you yeah. see that happen? And what's administrators looking for right now from the NCAA? You know, it's like their their biggest concern, of course, is the the recruiting inducements. Um, either, you know, to as a high school athlete to come to a school or the transfer portal transfers um, with boosters getting in there. 
I mean, how long has the NCAA tried to control boosters and hasn't really been able to get a hold of it? By, like, it's been decades of the same. It's instead of the brown bag of cash now, it's collectives and NIL when, you know, obviously, like, administrators want them to control that. They've never been able to. I don't know. Uh, so I think it's a really tough, tough situation. Is there a chance we could lose scholarships? You know, uh, not because of NIL, but I think that, you know, student athletes as employees, if it gets to that level, that there is some talk about a lot of, um, you know, the non-revenue generating sports being kind of demoted into a club level uh, type sport. I don't know. I, I don't see that happening any time in the next five years, knock on wood. Um, but I think that, that that is a reality. If you look at kind of the economics of intercollegiate athletics and like how the budgets all work, and it's like, it's a lot of subsidization by the university um, at the end of the day. So how do you really hold on to that when you're also having to provide salaries? And and is it is there any thought that it's even more work for the university now with NIL, the, the education part, the following up with it and all of that, and they're not getting a piece of that action. Yeah, I mean, how many things do universities do for the recruiting uh, kickback though? I think I just saw that Oklahoma is <laughs> building a new $175 million uh, uh, football facility that, because their old one is five years old and so they need a, a new one. Um, I was actually just building um, kind of a report for, for later today talking about all the different departments that have been impacted by NIL and have new responsibilities. And it really is, you know, of course you have compliance with the disclosures piece. Sports media is now, I mean, before they're kind of responsible for building athletes' brands, but now it's like falling on them as well as like a really, uh, I guess, eye around like gender equity issues as well. Like people are really paying attention to that now that, you know, those could lead to monetization opportunities. Um, your marketing department, kind of same as sports media, student athlete development, you've got your development fundraising team that's got to manage your donors and those expectations for fundraising versus NIL money and recruiting. Um, yeah, uh, your licensing department, you've got your corporate sponsors, your multimedia rights that's involved. Like it is across the whole department in terms of new responsibilities. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot. And and does playing time, is playing time now affected by your brand and that sort of thing? And uh, there's a demand to uh, to be out there mm -hmm. all the time? You know, I've heard that one as well. I haven't really uh, heard from a, a coach <laughs> that that has come to kind of a reality yet. But I could see that coming yesterday. <laughs> I was interested, actually. I would love to see, you know, with the, the Cavender twins, who've got those millions of followers transferred from Fresno to Miami, like how much them transferring kind of raise the NIL valuation of their teammates, if it did at all, because, you know, they're being tagged in the videos. They probably increase their, their followers and community just from that association with the Cavender twins. So I don't know. It's interesting. So if I was a friend of the Cavender twins and I've got in every one of their videos and got tagged, I might increase my followers by one, two, three, four thousand 4,000 people, therefore increasing my NLI value my name, image, and likeness value. Yep. I oh, don't know. Geez. I haven't seen any studies of that yet, but I imagine that there's some correlation there. So I don't need to follow people who can play volleyball or basketball. I need to follow somebody who's got millions of followers. To their and the Cavender twins them. are fine basketball players. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a fine basketball player. I need yeah. to go where the fine basketball player is who has a million followers. Oh, so one of my, my thoughts from a recruiting side, you know, recruited walk-ons to historically like maybe they have some family members in high places or their donors or supporters of the school and it's like does that shift now to an athlete has a big brand that can help the school's brand and also the team their teammates make more money is that a recruiting piece to this whole puzzle i don't know well there's a division three school in uh, grand rapids michigan uh a uh, young lady uh, went to work uh now has brought in more than two million dollars and she created an app for her teammates to be able to go out and earn enough money for uh, groceries every week if they want to use it. Uh, we had her on the show. She's uh, 
quite intelligent. Uh, dads quit work. Uh, moms quit work. Moms managing the the operation. Dads are agent, and uh, uh, they've got golf uh, people coming in and redoing the backyard. They've got all kinds of people going, and this is Division Three uh, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So it's out there. She's she's absolutely killed it. I think she actually bought her first house about a month ago. I oh, like, I didn't know that. Girl, girl. Um, yeah, well, Michelle. I, I'm a little slow on the uptake here. <laughs> I, I think there seems to be two completely different worlds out there. I mean, there's one world, you know, where the name, image, and likeness is you, you, you monetize that because you have a lot of followers in social media, all right, regardless of your, your playing ability. And then I think on the other side, it sounds like you have these collectives that have collected a lot of money from all different sources and they're awarding athletes because their quote, name, image, and likeness, these mega amounts of money to come play at, at their university. Mm -hmm. Am I seeing this right? I mean, this is, this is like two different things. One yeah. seems to be fine, a person, you know, or, or they're a great player, and now they're allowed to go out and do a commercial for the local, you know, car dealership, which may turn into them getting a car. I, that seems to be a lot different than that other piece with these collectives. Yep. Can, can you help me with that? Uh, the collectives piece I like to call uh, talent acquisition payments, <laughs> not NIL. <laughs> um, I don't know how uh, Tap. Tap. <laughs> how long that like that that that's the whole piece that is concerning the administrators. It's concerning the NCAA that they want to come down on. Now, how are they going to be able to control that without coming up with millions of dollars of new lawsuits? Um, I think that's the golden question because. Nobody wants, like, you have to have, I mean, as as fair as possible of a recruiting landscape, right? And this is just really kind of rocked, rocked the world, especially with the revenue generating sports. Um, now, was it something that was happening kind of under the table before? Yeah. Um, but now that it's much more open and public and considered legal-ish, uh, yeah, I... I don't know. Um, I think that in time, I don't. I don't know if those collectives are that sustainable. I think that they're already kind of figuring out that we wanted to pop this up right away because we were afraid of falling behind. We wanted to support our school, but this is a full time job, and this is even more than a full time job running these businesses on behalf of the universities. And it's also not a great position for the universities to be in. Like, so many athletic directors are going. I don't know if I trust that guy with all of my athletes like it's not a practice that is done at any level of sports to go okay here are all of my assets but they're the athletes and we're gonna push them off to this third party over here and uh see what happens um so i would imagine it's going to come a little bit more in-house um, in time um yeah and i also talked to a number of these collectives that are going we can't keep going back to the same well of donors year in and year out and asking for all this money when they're not really getting the same benefits that they got from donating to the school, like in terms of their, you know, VIP parking and their hospitality rooms at games and things like that. So um, it's definitely an interesting model. There was hundreds that have popped up, you know, in less than two years. Um, but I don't really see that being how it's going to go for the next couple of years. I think it'll become much more like the intention of NIL. And there's no, there's no tax write-offs for these people that that uh, donate to collectives, right? Yeah. So a uh, whole another uh, piece. So a lot of these collectives have um, applied for nonprofit status so that they can get those tax write-offs. Now the IRS has already come out and went, hold on a second. We don't really consider this to be a nonprofit uh, endeavor, but they haven't done anything about it yet that I've heard of at least. So. Uh, some of them have nonprofit status and they're getting their tax write-offs, which is kind of the worst nightmare of the athletic departments because that's, you know, their carrot that they can uh, dangle. <laughs> yeah, that's a big loss for uh, institutions in the revenue business. Yeah, it's yeah, something Fran, athletic directors, yeah. I was just going to ask Fran, she, she's been the most recent one dealing with this stuff of, of all of us. 
she's got to be just, you know, fidgeting in her chair right now with a million, a million things going through her head. Graham, what's your thoughts on this? Well, I think the biggest challenge for this is not for the athletes, it's for the coaches, right? The coaches having to navigate this and handle playing time and money. And, you know, I had a friend of ours I shared earlier with Bob and Mick that, you know, he's a basketball coach. He's trying to get his team ready for the NCAA tournament. And he was like, I, I got to schedule practice around when my kids need to tweet and post social media wise for the best bang for their buck. And so, you know, the coaches have no power in this. And, and I think the athletes now with the transfer portal and all of this, and then now you add the collective on top of it, I think they have so much control <laughs> that our, the athletes are just completely in control. And now where, do, you know, where does it go from here? How do coaches maintain the locker room? As you said, Michelle, you know, you alluded earlier to, I think I, that leans on the coaches to, to take care of this stuff. I don't know how coaches manage this anymore. You know, yeah. certainly I couldn't. Um, and I, I didn't have a lot of kids that were doing anything major, but, you know, I was at LSU and there were a lot of big, big deals with athletes at LSU, million dollar deals. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of unintended consequences for that. We, we had to have some pretty amazing things put into place to take care of these student athletes that were million dollar deal people. So I think there's there's so many unintended consequences that there's got to be some regulation that comes in. And uh, I like the fact that you're talking about something, you know, there's some things on the horizon, but uh, awfully difficult to manage it from a coaching perspective. And I'd be interested, Michelle, how many how many athletic departments actually have people like you in place? And is that going to be the trend that you're going to manage this from your perspective and take the pressure off the coaches and other people? Yeah, so right now it's only about 30 or 40 um, schools around the, the country have an NIL specific position. Um, it is growing. I think there's about five positions listed so far. The... <clears throat> Problem being that a lot of these schools will list this position with a laundry list of requirements that they are looking for, and then they'll leave it open for six, nine, ten months because nobody's qualified. Like I, I left San Diego State in January. Um, they actually opened my position in December, and they act they just reopened it because they couldn't find anyone. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, that kind of met all of those requirements, and so that because there, it really is a lot of hats that this person wears, you know, all the way from the social media best practices and personal branding, creating a strategy, entrepreneurship, negotiating contracts, understanding contract terms, um, financial literacy, like there's so many pieces that athletes come to you about. And it's also really slow process right now because so many like precedents are being set. Every deal is slightly different. I remember going at San Diego State, like to my supervisor, who's the director of compliance going, all right, I got another one. How are we going to manage this? Because it's just in terms of intellectual property, use of facilities, um, trademarks, and what's permissible and what's not permissible in California state law and institutional policy and all this stuff. It just is very complicated. Um, yeah. And I, I, I do feel for for the coaches, because I don't think they're getting a lot of guidance right now um, or how to manage this. And um, I, yeah, I will say though, if, a, if an athlete told me, oh, it, like we got to tweet at this time or post at this time, I'm like, get a social media manager, Pre <laughs> preload that, preload it on Sunday for the whole entire week, get it taken care of. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> See, you would say that, but I wouldn't know that you could even do that, yeah. that you could preload your social media on Sunday. I'll have to load that into my uh, coaching presentations that I do then some some tools to push your athletes towards. Yeah. And here's so an I idea. Maybe you should have a national, uh, not clinic, but a national presentation for coaches uh, so you can start to educate them because you're right. I don't think there's anybody out there helping the coaches right now. No. if I Like Fran said, I, I don't think I can. Have, and she said you could preload it. Now, I've been doing... I've been with kids my entire life. I didn't know that you could preload your tweets on Sunday so that they just automatically release all week long. Yeah, I'd be tweeting. There's actually a really cool campaign um, that came in for some of uh, the football athletes at San Diego State last year that they did all the kind of like content creation over the summer. So 
go into the, the restaurant, you know, film whatever they need. And then this company, they because they know that the most eyes are on the social media accounts during the season when the athletes are playing on Saturdays or whatnot. Um, but that's also the busiest time for athletes when they don't want to be thinking about, oh gosh, I got to like make this, you know, I promise I would post this on the Saturday. And so this company, you know, cut up all the content and then set them up with all a social media kind of planner and set it out months in advance with like the exact post graphic video, whatever it was, caption, all preloaded to go, you know, before or after their game on that Saturday or the Friday before or Sunday, I don't know, like around that so that the company still got the best ROI, but the athlete didn't have to think about it at all. But Michelle, I also, from, from a person who just managed student athletes, I mean, we're trying to get them to go to study hall on time and be at <laughs> practice on time. You, you know, I mean, for them to be that forward thinking, although these these kids that are graduating are the smartest kids that are ever going to graduate, right? Next year will be the smartest kids because they're getting yeah. more in high school. They're getting more education. They have more opportunity. But, I mean, how how in the world can we get them? I mean, I'm trying to get them to remember a game plan. I, I mean, there's so many things that are on their plate. And, yeah, that'd be great if they would do it but they don't even want to stay and train in the summer. They don't want to be around in the summer. They want their free time. They need to know why they need to be there, what they need to be doing. So it, it's a different mentality of student athlete as well as a different time for collegiate athletics. And those two things are really difficult to manage from a coaching and even an administrative point of view right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> pulling, pulling along for, I mean, that particular activation, like I think this brand did almost everything for them in terms of we're setting up your account, log in here, we'll set this up, approve it, and like that'll get posted. Like it wasn't, I don't think, because you're totally right. And that's been a lot of frustration with a lot of these um, kind of startups and, you know, even the marketplaces and the different things um, that are in place. And they're going, gosh, like we got to pull everybody along to, you know, even though I'm offering them this much money and they just won't reply to my texts and my emails and going, yeah, uh, it's definitely, definitely a challenge in a reality. <laughs> All right, Michelle, I, I'd like to thank you for, for coming on. Uh, we want to, you know, we respect your time, so we don't want to keep you too long, uh, but really appreciate all the information you were able to provide us on NIL. It's eye-opening to say the least. <laughs> Thank you for the new three-letter anagram, Talent Acquisition Payments tab. That's, <laughs> I'm adding that to my vocabulary. <laughs> I've just started to push that as well. I kind of like it. I'm like, it's not NIL, yeah. it's TAP. Talent yeah, Acquisition TAP, TAP, you need that's to, what you I You need got. to quickly go online and, and copyright that so no one can steal it from you. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. All righty. Well, thank you that's guys awesome. for having me. Um, and I enjoyed the conversation. Thank, thank you, Michelle. You. Very interesting. Thank you. Gotcha. All right, group, we're going to transition into buzz reaction. Uh, I'll, I'll start with Fran first. Uh, Fran, what was your reaction to all this? Uh, it's just such a tumultuous time for everybody, right? For student athletes trying to figure this out, for, for coaches, for administrators, for the NCAA. I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, there'll be a ton more changes, but I I honestly think the student athletes and the people who can gain an advantage and take advantage of the opportunities that are here today, they should do it. And they should, they should go in full bore and, and uh, get as much as they can. Because as we know, all of us being in NCAA athletics for as long as we have, there will be some regulation that comes down at some point and things will change. Rick, I guess we got an answer to, to your question you were asking me. Hey, hey Bob. Have you seen all the athletic directors that have, have been, you know, resigning? This might yeah, be over, over 80, over 80. Uh, think about that. Over 80 athletic directors just walked in the last year or so, and uh, I see more of them walking. Yeah, you can't possibly stay on top of this without a staff uh, and a, a very specific delineation. Many of the new, the new, the new concept looks like the athletic director doesn't work with the coaches. The athletic director works with finances, uh, works with sponsorships, works with uh, alumni, but uh, doesn't have anything to do with the coaches. Uh, and yet 
many of them want to try to hire coaches and they don't have a clue because their their deal is business so this is this is going to be an interesting time to see how they de devise the infrastructure of an athletic department to function with hundreds of millions of dollars rolling in uh from some of these sports uh and I, I thought it was interesting that the NC2A uh, basketball tournament, especially the men's side, looked like they were trying to uh, work off of the Super Bowl uh, ad marketing. Did you notice how the ads would pop up and there would be multiple ads and some would try to be funny and some would try to be this and that? And it just got me to thinking about here's another Super Bowl model. So, I mean, that's over what? almost $300 million profit uh, for the NC2A right there. So, Well, you know, Mick, you and I, and I'm sure the other two coaches here with us today have had the same problem. You're at your school. You get a booster who comes to you back in the day who says, hey, how can I help volleyball? You and the booster chat. You go to your marketing and development people and say, I've got this booster who wants to do volleyball. And the next thing you hear is, well, we're going to talk to him and we'll let you know what we get for volleyball because we think he's got more money and he should do something for the other sports more than he should do for volleyball. Yeah, yeah I had that deal with uh, with my athletic director at USC. Uh, I came to him with uh, basically an a offer of, of a little bit more than $2 million. And uh, he said, listen, I'll give you whatever you need for the volleyball program, but this is a big-time donor and we need him for the football stadium remodel. Um, and so uh, I, I actually brought them two, and I think one did the sand complex and the other did uh, a certain part of the football remodel, uh, and volleyball didn't get that, that money, uh, right. That and, money. Right. And my point now is it used to be that the AD was in competition with his own coaches for funds and used to have to have a whole bunch of guidelines for who you were allowed to talk to and who you couldn't talk to. And if you brought somebody in with this amount of money, you didn't get them anymore. Well, now that same thing's happening with the kids. The kids might get somebody that the, that the AD couldn't get. And now what does the AD say to that kid? Hey, we've been after that guy for years. How'd you get him? We need you to help you get, a, get him in here with us. Yeah, and Bill, I would go ahead. Yeah. I would take that the next step. And what I'm seeing in, in my market is a lot of the big donors that are have signed kids to NIL deals are also signing coaches to deals in the same way. So now the coaches are jumping into the fray to gain sponsorship beyond their employment contract with some of these donors, local donors, so that they're not left out and they're the kids aren't making more in the region than they are from the local people. Really? I don't know why I don't know why we didn't think that that was going to happen. You know, that's it's, it's happening. Obvious. Oh, that that's like a lightning bolt for me right now. I'm yeah. like, "Oh my god. That makes so much sense." Yeah. Yeah, the 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 name image and likeness for some of these coaches are are as great or greater than than the athletes. So it yeah. does make sense if you think about it. Shashevsky yep. replaced Saban laying at the pool on the uh, <laughs> the last commercial. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, that's because his hair color is real and Saban's isn't. <laughs> <laughs> the, Ch the Chicago boy is in his seventies and still has dark hair, so we're using him instead of Saban with his fake brown hair. <laughs> I actually coach with with uh, Saban's father. Back really? At point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were there wow. at the same time. Fran, how you like retirement? Yeah, I, I love I love retirement, um, especially after uh, enjoying this Zoom with you guys. Even more reason to not be in this <laughs> game anymore. <laughs> Well, you got that for sure. I mean, think about this. I mean, your life has just got to be miserable or or you have to figure out a way to win and reduce your stress um, because you can't take all this stuff seriously or you just jump off the second story of your house sooner or later. Well, I you talked about club sports, Mick, but anybody who notices what's going on with NIL 
and high schools and clubs, it's only a matter of time before we see Drive Nation become a fully sponsored junior club program, meaning the kids don't have to pay any dues and they go out and recruit kids from everywhere to play for Drive Nation. Well, there's one of those deals going on in Tampa. There's one of those deals going on all over. I mean, the the thing is, though, they never work because they never, after the initial group of kids that they really liked graduates and goes on, they never get that same quality again or have that appeal. And so eventually the sponsor who's doing it is not making enough money. And so it goes away. Uh, that's that's been the history of that over the years. There have been a number of people, including Anva, way back when. Anva, you didn't pay any money. Mm -hmm. You know that was the first club that that actually paid for the athletes, but uh, nobody cared when they all went to USC and played for Chuck Irby and won does L O does L O in a row. <laughs> does L O V B have the strength to eventually develop a big enough marketing and R O I? that they could get their clubs and their pro teams all interconnected in a way where it's all paid for and you go play for those clubs if you're really good? Well, I think, I think they, they might be trying to do that. Uh, it'd be interesting, but I just don't think it lasts. Uh, and, and Fran used the word sustainable and I think that's right. I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think this kind of money is sustainable. I don't think the clubs can, uh, can basically maintain if they start paying the players uh, more than they're paying them now uh, because they're they're taking certain players on with no fees uh, while everybody else pays for them. And your second, third, and fourth, and fifth teams are paying for the first team to travel all over the country. Uh, you know, parents are getting tired of that. Uh, kids don't know any different. And uh, so it's a, it's a situation that's pretty much out of control until people wake up and figure it out and say, you know, there's a better model. This is going to continue to go on. Well, M Michelle kind of alluded to that uh, when she was talking about in general terms, when I asked her the question about what administrators are looking for from the NCAA, I just wonder if she'd be better off not having any rules at all and the marketplace is eventually going to take care of it. I mean, you know, you, you can't, you know, the, the power five, they're going to have the money no matter what. All right. And, and so why, why put these regulations in that, that, you know, they're going to just find ways to get around them. I mean, eventually it's going to play itself out. You know, people are going to give only so much money before they realize they're not getting a return on their investment or they're not getting the tax right off they need, or, you know, and I just, there's always going to be somebody that has a little bit more than somebody else, and you're just going to have to do the best you can. Well, I think it comes up to who's going to be next, right? So the, the people that are investing now in this are not people that invested 10 or 15 years ago. And, and as this grows, some may disappear, and then the next may appear, and there'll just be another model. And the interesting thing for me will be when these student athletes who have benefited from the NLI, NIL, um, will they come back and pay it forward? Like some of, I mean, we have plenty of athletes at LSU who, who sponsored things, who were big donors to LSU afterwards. You know, will they come back and pay it forward and, and sponsor athletes behind them? It'll be interesting to see. You know what's more interesting? Some, somebody really manages their brand really well in college for four years. They're making, they're making a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars. They get a degree, and their first job is seventy thousand dollars. <laughs> they take a pay cut for the rest of their life, <laughs> or maybe they can't get a job because they really didn't pay attention in the class because they were spending so much time trying to make the money uh, and spending it while they were in college. Or, or what's going to happen, Mick, is if, if they made their money the way the NIL was set up, that might continue to be their job because they're going to be influencers. And they'll, like this young lady you were talking about in Grand Rapids that we had, you know, on a show last year. I mean, she, she's done it kind of the right way using social media. And, and, and it's not just because of her playing ability. It's because of her networking and, and following. 
But she so, really had a good show. I mean, her presentation when she decked out her bedroom or built her garage or got the, the saw out and tore up everything. I mean, she was good. And, and it was uh, basically a show. Uh, didn't right. really have anything to do with her volleyball. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. If everybody's an influencer, who are they going to influence? Each other? I mean... Uh, one of the reasons we have this situation, I believe, is that we've lost the middle class and we have an exorbitant amount of money on one group and, and uh, very little money to be able to offer the other half of the country. And the people with the money don't know what to do with it, so they can throw it into these combines and, and these kinds of things. Uh, uh, and it doesn't make a dent on their lifestyle or, or anything else. I mean... People, people with billions of dollars and just are hanging on to it or throwing it around. It's just out there like that. So you're going to expect these kinds of things and schools with deep alumni. I mean, the schools actually want this money. So they're, they're recruiting these people to get these donations from them. And, and now we have the coaches uh, getting NLI. We got the players getting NLI, NIL, excuse me. And, We've got all of all of these kinds of things. Um, I think it's going to blow up. Uh, I really do. And you're right, Fran. I think you said, or maybe Michelle said, she doesn't think that Congress is going to be able to come up with anything. And she's not. They're not because they all have different state laws. I think we talked about that in our group uh, last week. Uh, different state laws. You know, a high school kid in, in California can make NIL, NIL money right now. Uh, they just have to pay 13% state tax. Um, a high school kid in Texas can, can do NIL, but can't be eligible to play high school sports. Uh, <laughs> so why well, have NIL if you can't play? You know, it's a, uh, Ewers, the quarterback, didn't play his senior year uh, up in Dallas and, w and went to Ohio State for a year, made a bunch of NIL money, then transferred back to Texas, made even more NIL money. Um, from the collectives, uh, I mean, it, it, they're just throwing it around. I worry what happens to these people. They get used to all this money and they're not coming by it in a way that it's sustainable for them to have income like that. So it, it'll be, it'll be interesting, the rude awakening. And then who do they blame is, is the next phase, oh, right? Coaches got to blame the coaches. Right. That's for sure. Right. Coach right. didn't and prepare me. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and the coach and the university and the athletic department and, yeah. you know, they, they, you know, they use their name, image and likeness to gain this. But we again, that's the next step that we didn't do to help them as coaches. And we all know we all bend over backwards to help these kids and help them grow up and mature and and create a great future. But, you know, there's there's always a need for more. Right. Well, there, there is something to be said for letting people fail and learning from it. Um, and we've just gone away from that concept ever since Bill said the 90s, but I would say the 70s when we started giving everybody a trophy um, <laughs> because they played in the league, you know. And uh, I, I, just, I just think this thing can only go so far. Um, and we'll see, the, we'll see the outcome, but... Uh, um, I don't know where the correction point is. Well, well on that point, we'll uh, we'll call a time because we're just about finished up. Uh, and uh, good show, everyone. I think we, we covered a lot of topics uh, and really exhausted NIL, at least at this point. It'll change next week. <laughs> but, Bill, you got to remember the TAP also. Tap. I know. I'm gonna. I'm getting my copyright website out right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're certainly finding out more than we want to know. That's for sure. That's uh. It's yeah, the rumor. The rumor is making more fun to talk about. The reality is more scary. Yeah, and I don't even have a rant this week. I had a rant about the portal, but I I can't even have a rant about this. This is just. It, it's mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah, it's too much. Well, we'll we'll have another good show next week. Uh, we'll change gears a little bit for for next week. Um, and Fran, we we're looking forward to having you on again. So thanks again for filling in for Kathy. I'm sure 
she appreciates it quite a bit. Well, I, I don't know if I can really fill in for Kathy, but it was fun to be part and I appreciate you, you allowing me to join. <laughs>